I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to uh, come out and um, hear uh, some very positive news. I had a great opportunity to visit with uh, our new state superintendent for public instruction, Ms. Diane Douglas. Uh, very impressed with uh, her depth and understanding of the issue of uh, our ethnic studies program. Um, I also appreciate the fact that uh, she was just sworn in and made time um, as uh, quickly as she did to sit down and have a conversation. We spent about an hour and a half visiting uh, about the uh, TUSD ethnic studies program as well as the uh, federal desegregation court order and what we can do to reestablish trust and communication. And some of the highlights of our conversation uh, really center on uh, us opening the door and inviting uh, members of the Arizona Department of Education into our classrooms to observe what's going on and how materials are being used uh, to provide feedback uh, and to provide ideas and suggestions. I was, um, I was just uh, extremely impressed by the uh, state superintendent's uh, desire to uh, develop standards that recognize the contributions of uh, Latino people in the state of Arizona as well as in the United States and to have that information as part of the uh, Arizona uh, co career and uh, college standards and so that was also very uh, very uh, impressive. Uh, I, uh, she offered uh, that I uh, take part in the advisory committee that she's putting together that would help devise uh, standards, curricular standards for uh, Latino, Hispanic um, contributions uh, to the state. And uh, these standards then would become part of the uh, Arizona uh, College and Career Rating of Standards. And so I uh, very uh, graciously and humbly uh, accepted the uh, request to serve on the committee. So I feel very good about the opportunities that we have moving forward. It doesn't mean that there uh, will not be challenges. I'm sure there will be, but I feel very confident that we'll be able to work these challenges out, considering that um, I asked uh, Mr. Uh, Hoopenthal a month ago to have an opportunity to sit down with him and was never given that opportunity. And on the same day I asked uh, State Superintendent Douglas for a meeting, uh, her office called back immediately and scheduled the meeting the very next day at noon. And uh, that type of responsiveness sends a very good message that uh, we can reestablish trust and communication between the Tucson Unified School District and the Arizona Department of Education. So I really feel that it's a new opportunity that we have. I don't feel that the uh, state agency wants to uh, shut down our ethnic studies program, but really wants to uh, take a, a look at how we can uh, work together to address any questions or concerns uh, with the law that uh, is uh, currently in the Ninth Circuit. And so, as we all know, until um, that case is uh, done, the law is the law, and uh, we uh, work together. I'll uh, end by saying this, and uh, then open it up to questions. Um, ethnic studies programs, from a Mexican-American point of view, or from an African-American point of view, are not about teaching hatred or teaching distrust against any group of people. To teach from an African-American or a Latino perspective means looking at history and literature from that lens. It doesn't mean and it doesn't require in looking through that lens to uh, disparage or despise or feel hatred or angst towards another group of people. It's a matter of appreciating the contributions of uh, African-American and uh, Latino people and what they brought to the table and the struggles and how they view historical circumstance. And it's that balanced perspective. And so I just want to reiterate that ethnic studies aren't about teaching hatred. It's rather about teaching understanding. And in the world we live in today, we need more understanding for each other. We need to appreciate and recognize that the strength of this nation isn't isolated thought, but rather the multitude of perspectives to the issues that are so big, but when we face them together, are not as big and not as insurmountable. So I'll be more than happy to take any questions. So the notice from uh, former Lieutenant Newman though is still on the table. The district could still lose this potential funding come March. The notice, um, you know, the notice is on the table uh, in the sense that um, 
I didn't go in there uh, demanding or requesting that uh, that be taken off the table because if I were to go in from that point of view, it would mean that I, I, I feared what we're doing isn't uh, in the best interest of students and that what we're doing is in violation of the law. What I went in to do is uh, to um, state that our goal, our focus and purpose is to provide literature and to provide history from an African-American and Mexican-American perspective as is required in the unitary status plan. But if we do a, uh, if, if we do an injustice to that work by uh, teaching hatred, and that's not what our teachers are about, I had a chance to visit with them yesterday, and that's not in their heart, uh, that is on the table. But um, I feel that uh, with communication and dialogue, uh, we're opening the doors to send documents for their review. Uh, we'll do that every two weeks, and uh, I had the assurance uh, from the Arizona Department of Ed, from uh, the uh, people that will uh, work through this with us, that uh, we'll get feedback in a timely manner, that it won't be at the end of March, uh, when the 60 days has expired, that we'll get notice that we uh, were non-compliant, but that if there are questions or concerns, as quick as those questions and concerns are identified, that they'll turn those back to us and we'll work together um, on a, a solution. And so, yes, it's on the table, but I feel very confident uh, that with trust and communication and by opening the doors and inviting people from the Arizona Department of Education into our classrooms to see what our students are learning and to uh, understand uh, the power of, uh, of the classes, that, uh, that we'll address this. So because we have to wait until tomorrow to hear from the Department of Education, they've, they've said they're not going to make a statement until tomorrow, um, can you give us your interpretation of whether or not Douglas is on the same path as Hoopenthal, or did you see it as she, based on just the document that, that Hoopenthal wrote? Is it something she disagrees with or something that she agrees with? You know, I understand the complexity of her position. She's an elected official who, when she took her oath of office, stated that she would enforce the laws of the state of Arizona. And the document that was left by uh, outgoing superintendent of public ed instruction, Hoopenthal, alleges that that's the case. The opportunity that uh, we have is to show that what's in that document um, is uh, not uh, correct and that uh, there's more to uh, the work that we've put together. My sense is from visiting with her, and, and I can only speak from my sense, is that if her design and desire was to eliminate ethnic studies in TUSD, she would not have invited me to serve on a committee that is uh, going to devise instructional standards that provide the perspective of uh, Latinos uh, into the state curriculum. And I have to believe that those two things cannot coexist, a desire to eliminate ethnic studies and to silence the voices of a group of people, and then the desire to develop curricular standards that would give voice to a group of people. So I have to believe that her desire and intent is uh, for us to do a good job with our work and then for us to take an opportunity to expand that. She said something very uh, compelling in our conversation and um, it probably will best answer your question. It was this, she asked how many schools uh, will you have ethnic studies in? Um, and I said, by the end of the second semester, we're looking at seven, potentially eight. She said, how many schools do you have in TUSD? I said, we have 89. She says, wouldn't it be good to teach this point of view and this perspective in all 89 schools? And so that, that's a good statement. That's a good statement. It's a good olive branch. And I, I uh, feel that, um, that it's something that we can work together on. Ethnic studies on their own for so long. 
Well, if you take a look at ethnic studies in and of the nature of ethnic studies, to talk about uh, the Latino or African American perspective devoid of the mainstream, uh, widely accepted perspective on historical uh, circumstance uh, doesn't provide for the level of dialogue and depth of understanding needed to understand history or literature from a Latino or African American point of view, to understand the writings of Du Bois outside of the context of his time, to understand the history of Frederick Douglass outside of the context of the time makes no sense. So the context, the widely accepted or the uh, mainstream context that you find in textbooks is a beginning point for any conversation uh, taking a look at uh, a, a, a historical circumstance from the point of view. I mean, take the assassination of President Kennedy. If you take a look at that from a mainstream point of view, you understand the factors behind the assassination. But take a look at it from a Hispanic or an African American point of view. The assassination of Kennedy to many signaled uh, a stop or a stymie or perhaps the end of movement towards the 64 Civil Rights Act. And so to understand the assassination of the president from the point of view of a Latino or African American is very different from that of a, of a citizen who already had rights, who already had equal access, who already had equal opportunity. So to say that you only have to teach from this point of view and you can't teach from these other point of views, it takes things out of context and therefore the depth and the rich nature of an ethnic studies program really uh, falls on deaf ears. Um, will teachers still have the freedom to bring in um, the other tools such as songs and, and essays and things that they think could play a role in the discussions in the classroom. We have board policy that allows teachers to bring in supplementary occasional use materials. And as long as those materials are within what we would expect for any set of materials, I'll give an example. Um, if uh, we would in a general education classroom prohibit uh, materials that uh, have inappropriate images or inappropriate language in our regular curricula, then we would consider those same standards for any other supplementary material. We wouldn't uh, want to bring something in that would uh, violate uh, the, uh, the uh, policy as it sits with uh, what is uh, instructionally appropriate or what is age appropriate. But to answer your question directly, yes, teachers will be allowed to bring in uh, supplementary instructional materials. And as a matter of fact, what uh, we will focus on as we move into this uh, next semester uh, will be our teachers coming together, working together, sharing ideas and bringing their materials to the table, uh, working together in the creation of lesson plans and really uh, drilling deep and creating a depth and um, taking what's written in our curricular standards uh, to the lesson level uh, so that anybody could pick up those lessons and understand by reading those lessons the merit of those lessons and how those lessons will enrich our students and prepare them to be critical thinkers or uh, to uh, engage in such dialogue at any level they so choose. Is it possible that any teachers have brought in material that has been inappropriate? You know, uh, you, you ask a uh, question that's a rhetorical question because when you have a district with 89 school sites and over uh, uh, 3,000 teachers, um, I'm sure it happens uh, across the board. And when it comes to these classes, I understand that they're under a higher level of scrutiny. And so it's just a matter of our uh, campus administrators, our department chairs, our curriculum office, um, all of us working together to really provide good guidance and guidelines uh, and, uh, and what would be considered an appropriate material. It's not to say that, uh, uh, you know, it, it has or hasn't happened. It, it's just a reality that people will bring in information and will bring in materials that they feel are appropriate and uh, you may have a parent uh, or you may have an administrator who uh, finds them uh, inappropriate. And so it's a matter of understanding the nature of these classes and the scrutiny they're under, really being very deliberate and taking a look at what we bring into the classroom and taking a look at what we brought into the classroom to this point from that same critical lens. It's very appropriate. So what will the next 60 days look like? I mean, how often will state inspectors be in these classrooms and just how frequently you have to provide documentation curriculums? What, what do you anticipate? So um, Ms., uh, or Dr. Johnson, a former uh, superintendent of Mesa, who is uh, one of the uh, deputy uh, superintendents in the Arizona Department of Education has been tasked with working with uh, TUSD, 
myself, uh, Mr. Steve Holmes, our assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction in uh, building and lining out a calendar of opportunities for the state to come in, uh, as well as setting the dates for our professional development, our teacher training, our collaboration, our curriculum design, and inviting them in. So our work will be to put the dates on the calendar with the Arizona Department of Education and find dates that work for them, find dates that work for us, and invite them in and let them take part in what we're doing. Uh, so we'll begin working uh, through that uh, as soon as uh, you know we hit the office tomorrow, we're gonna begin our work on setting up those opportunities and dates so that we can invite people in to see what we're doing. 60 days is not a long time. Did they indicate whether they want to come in weekly, bi-weekly, monthly? Um, I asked them to come in as often and as frequent as they feel is necessary. Um, if they wanted to come in daily, I'm comfortable with that. And uh, so, um, I mean, I think what they'll see is they'll see students eager to learn and excited. They'll see teachers who love their kids and love teaching. And, uh, and, and that's the best thing that could happen for us, is for them to come in and see what we do, to meet our kids, to know their names, to meet our teachers, to understand uh, their passion, and to understand uh, what they're trying to put forward to the students. And um, I'm not opposed to any of that level of dialogue. We just want to do it in concert with the Arizona Department of Education. And I can't say prior to today, I felt that that was their desire too, but I can say as of today and forward, and uh, moving forward, unless I see something else, I am very hopeful that they're uh, very sincere in uh, working with us uh, to uh, devise uh, courses that um, are in line with the Unitary Status Plan and uh, that, uh, uh, that, that do best by our kids. You already had an open door policy. They could have come in whenever they want before. You gave them the documents they asked for, but you believe this is different? I do believe it's different. You know, um, leadership is a, uh, is a powerful, <coughs> is a very powerful, um, phenomena in our work because an organization takes on the persona of its leader and I have to feel that uh, Superintendent Douglas's uh, thumbprint on public instruction in Arizona will be a good one. I have to believe that and, and, and I do and I feel that the people that work under her leadership will assume the temperament and the perspective that she's put forward and um, I have no reason to not take uh, Superintendent uh, Douglas for uh, her word and what she offered and what she presented. And so I, 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 uh, I'm very optimistic. I'm just very optimistic that under her leadership, she even expressed a desire to, uh, to, to be very visible and very present across the state of Arizona and into uh, classrooms and into schools to see what's going on and I, I feel very good about that. I mean, you know, the fact that she uh, was a governing board member provides her some unique perspective the previous two state superintendents didn't have. I mean, she dealt with the day in and day out work and um, there is perspective that you get from doing that that you don't from being a lifelong politician. Did she indicate herself that she'd be making a trip down here to visit some of the classes herself? Uh, she made an indication that she uh, would uh, she would come to visit in terms of visiting uh, classrooms uh, specifically. Um, you know, in our conversation, uh, she did not make the statement that I will go into the classrooms myself personally, but she did state that she would uh, that she will be in uh, Southern Arizona, and if she is in Southern Arizona at any point in time, even after the 60 days. Um, I will uh, make it a point to in invite her to the campuses where we offer these because I want her to uh, see the work that we're doing. So here today you are sound fairly confident that this threat to cut the funding with this new trust and communication won't be an issue in, in two months. You know, I, I feel it won't because I, I feel that we will do everything that we need to do to be in compliance. What some have been misled to believe is that the unitary status plan, this federal court order is a carte blanche to do whatever we want, and it's not. It's not in good taste or good practice to uh, teach hatred, and it's not in good taste or good practice to teach uh, the overthrow of the government. That's not what is in good taste or good practice, and that's not what we want to do. It's a matter of the uh, state officials standing next to TUSD officials, standing next to TUSD teachers, having a conversation about um, what's occurring in the classrooms that some may not understand so that there's clarity. And as long as people are willing to 
understand each other's point of view and respect it and not come in with predisposed ideals, uh, we should be able to uh, meet uh, what's, uh, being, what's being requested at this time. And so again, you know, I, I feel very confident. Uh, I think uh, I, I understand uh, Superintendent Douglas's uh, predicament. I mean, a year and a half ago, I walked into many things that I didn't initiate, but yet I had to follow through with. And, um, and, and, and she's in that situation. And so we want to do our best to build a partnership. You're talking a little bit more about the long term or a few weeks from now or two months from now. Was there one thing that you said as we both walk out of this office, we will do this to sort of initiate the process of starting that trust or starting that um, review of the courses? Yes, we did. Um, this is what I feel is the biggest departure. Um, I stated that if there was an issue that the state felt we were not addressing, that if we weren't delivering enough documents or if we weren't delivering them in a timely manner, that as opposed to waiting until it got to a point that they felt um, they needed to issue a uh, harsh letter, that they would pick up the phone and call me, that they would pick up the phone and say, HT, these are our concerns, can you help us with it? And the fact that they said, that Superintendent Douglas said, we will communicate with you as we see these things and we will let you know, that's a stark contrast from what we witnessed before, where we went for a whole semester, we went for a whole semester of silence. And then at the end, we receive a notice that says we're out of compliance. It would make a lot more sense and that was what I felt very good about, to reestablish trust that communication is key. And that as soon as there are questions or concerns, if uh, the state feels that things aren't being moved along quickly enough, that they will give me a call and that they will let me know and that we will set a meeting and we will address it urgently together. Did the new superintendent say there was anything that she was uncomfortable with based on the notice of um, compliance or anything that she asked that you not do anymore? You know, uh, it, it was really just a, a, re a request for a reassurance for me that we would uh, abide by the state law and uh, that we would uh, really take a very close and deliberate look at the materials that we're using and how we're using them and uh, what's being taught to the students and uh, how we're uh, certain that what's in our curricular documents uh, are uh, being translated into good instruction uh, on the campus and in the classroom level. Um, the people around the table, some who were there in uh, the previous administration said that our curricular documents are good and our scope and sequence of what should be taught at what point in the semester was good. All of this was good. Uh, what they asked for was that uh, what, what's in those documents is more evident in the teacher lesson plans and more evident in what's going on in the classroom. And so to show that tie, um, I have no problem stating that our commitment would be uh, to share our lesson plans and to show how they're aligned to the standards and aligned to our curriculum and um, to share what our uh, principal's observations and curriculum department's observations are as they go in and visit these classrooms. So it's again just a matter of um, hyper transparency. Will the visits focus only on the areas highlighted in the uh, non compliance letter? Um, I think initially, I mean, if you take a look at uh, the uh, appendix in the non compliance letter, that's a tremendous amount of information. And so I would assume that it would begin there. Um, but anytime you step into a classroom, um, it's very dynamic and it's very rich and there's a lot that occurs in there. But I would uh, assume that it would begin there as that's what they committed to writing. There are no other questions. Thank you all so much for y'all's time and we look forward to um, a very positive resolution in this. Thank you. Thank you.